Hello guys, welcome to our channel. Let's discuss what the average person's sex life was like under Henry Tudor. Enjoy the video. The House of Tudor ruled England between 1485 and 1603, and its most famous monarch was probably the oft-married, larger-than-life King Henry. Henry was well known for his many executions. He also had lots of romantic romps, in wedlock, to be fair, but is that what life was like for his constituents in Tudor England? Not by most accounts in fact, sexuality was even more stigmatized and not nearly as pleasant for men and women as it is for most today. Marriage in Tudor England wasn't fun for most women, whether or not they were wives or ladies of the night in Elizabethan cathouses. Intercourse wasn't for pleasure, but for the purpose of giving birth to children. Tudor life offered up some really questionable methods of Tudor contraception, and a person's age of sexual activity was pretty much at the onset of puberty for young women, way before either party was likely emotionally ready. So then, what was childbirth like in Tudor times? Not much better. Dirty, isolated, and pretty darn painful. All around, sex was pretty awful back then. Female contraceptives included vinegar-soaked tampons and wax seals. Contraception was traditionally illegal in England in Tudor times and had been for several centuries. Female contraceptives still existed, but they didn't employ particularly advanced methods. Women could insert wool soaked in vinegar into their vaginas. Supposedly, the astringency of vinegar closed off the womb to questing sperm. Women also plugged up the entrances to their vaginas with beeswax seals or blocks of wood. Men tied knots around their left testicles to ensure they sired sons. During the Tudor period, the right testicle was believed to contain all the seed necessary to sire a son, and the right side of the uterus produced boys. Accordingly, the left testicle was employed to have a daughter. In order to father a son, Tudor men tied knots around the left side of their genitals to restrict the girl producing sperm and make sure they had boys. Impotence remedies included quail testicles. If a guy couldn't get it up, apothecaries brewed up tons of bizarre remedies to cure that ailment. One recipe mixed quail testicles with large winged ants, bark oil, and amber. Beans also supposedly assisted a man's overcoming dysfunction in the bedroom. It wasn't just average Joe's suffering from impotence. By the time of his death, even King Henry might have had Ed. Men could punish their wives by treating them inhumanely. Unsurprisingly, the Tudor dynasty didn't herald in a wealth of equality for women. Men could punish their wives in almost any way they chose. If women were found guilty of committing adultery, their hubbies could toss them out. Men who thought their wives talked too much could put them in scolds bridles and drag them around. These brutal contraptions were iron versions of horses bridles with tongue depressors so the woman couldn't speak. The church said intercourse was solely for the purpose of procreation. The Catholic Church promoted only intercourse within marriage. In an effort to control impulses, the church suggested it should solely be for the purpose of procreation, rather than for pleasure. A woman's role was to bear children in particular, sons so conception was king. Female orgasms were believed necessary for conception. In Tudor times, the female orgasm was considered essential to conception. In theory, the woman would emit seed of her own, aka female ejaculate. That would mix with her partner's seed and fertilize her. Girls could marry at 12, boys at 14. Women in the Tudor period were considered of marriageable age shortly after they hit puberty. Why? That meant they were able to conceive children. As a result, upper-class parents married their daughters off at ages as young as 12. Henry's own mom, Margaret Beaufort, married her first husband at age 12 and gave birth to a son her only child at age 13, she was widowed that same year. But average Janes of the time were often married in their 20s. Most didn't want to bring a spouse into their parents' households. Men, in particular, waited until they'd made enough cash to set up their own homes. Only then would it be ideal to bring a wife to manage their new households and create a family. Intimacy was tainted by Eve's sin in the Garden of Eden. The Book of Genesis details how Eve ate the fruit of knowledge from a tree in the Garden of Eden, becoming the catalyst for the fall of humankind. As a result, men blamed women for just about everything and saw all women as inherently flawed, tainted by original sin. The church argued that women's lusts and desires should be maintained in the institution of marriage. The act was forbidden during fasts like Lent and certain days of the week. Tudor sex wasn't allowed just any day of the week. For example, couples couldn't do it during religious occasions that require abstention from pleasures, like Lent. According to some historians, it was verboten to have relations on certain days of the week namely, Wednesdays, Saturdays, and Sundays. 
marriage was necessary to contain the human desire for sex. The best way to get close to God, according to the church? Remain celibate. Not everyone could be so holy, though, and curb the innate desire to fornicate. As a result, marriage was the next best thing, since it meant keeping the act within the confines of the church. Later, during the Reformation, the idea that getting married and procreating was actually really good caught on. Thanks for watching. Do like, subscribe and comment.